Now we are going to start uh, session one, ocean energy. What are the next steps in successful industrialization? So our moderator of this session is Jean Maciel. He's board member of EDP New Center for New Energy Technologies. Uh, can I ask Jean and all the speakers of this session to open your cameras, please, and prepare your presentations. Thank you. So Patrick Muller, Jussie Ackerberg, Fred Gardner, Simon de Pietro, Jason Heyman. Here we are. Thank you. So the floor is yours, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, good morning to, to all. Um, I hope to find you all well and healthy. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Wavec and uh, for the invitation, and of course acknowledge the, the role of Wavec in the development of the uh, the wave and the the ocean energy sector, in, namely in Portugal and in Europe. And in fact, this seminar has become almost a landmark in the in the sector. I'm very happy to be here with you, sharing uh, sharing uh, this session today. Um, it's unfortunate that we are not together, but I hope that you find the, the seminar uh, useful towards the development of ocean energy in uh, in the coming in the coming years. Um, so this session one is on uh, ocean energy. Uh, what are the next steps for a successful industrialization? Uh, my name is João Maciel. I, I work for ADP for the research and development area. And let me just say uh, some some brief words before I introduce my my the members of this session. Um, as was said today, we also feel in, firmly believe that decarbonization is a matter of survival of our planet. It's not just a, a, like uh, to be better, or it's it's a matter of sur uh, survivability. Oh, sorry, uh, can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. Uh, just to ask other speakers, are you hearing uh, Jean Maciel? Can you? No. Okay. So it's my problem. Thank you. Okay. So, as I was saying, to to achieve the let's say the Paris Agreement uh, goals uh, and to set let's say the, the rise in temperature to to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, we need to do basically two things. One is to to use less energy to become more efficient. And to, we can do that through electrification, energy efficiency, or for example, green H2. Uh, and, but we also need to produce greener electricity or non-emissions electricity. And to, to produce electricity, um, the, the energy mix will be diverse. Uh, I guess there is no, let's say, there is no silver bullet. And all we should pursue all forms of, of electricity generation uh, that show progress, that mature, so that we can create options for the coming years and decades regarding the carbonization of our uh, energy mix. Ocean energy has been developing uh, from, let's say, from theoretical developments in the 1970s to experimental and lab developments in the last decades of the, the 20th century and, uh, and closer in the last two decades with, with the growing maturity and longer sea trials. So there has been a significant progress in the, let's say, in the, in the last uh, 40, 50 years. Um, there are several concepts in wave and tidal, and today we have some of the best examples to show to you uh, in terms of development and uh, ideas going forward. Um, so I'd suggest we we uh, we discover the new developments in, in wave and tidal and discuss what are the challenges for industrialization. And now the most important part, my my colleagues for today. Um, so I have Patrick Moller, which is the CEO of uh, of Core Power. I have Juicy Ackerberg, which is the CTO of AW Energy. I have Fred Gardner, which is the CEO of Teamwork Technology. I have Simon Di Pietro, which is the CEO of DP Energy. And I have Jason Hyman, which is the CEO of Sustainable Marine Energy. Uh, please stay with us for this uh, one point one and a half hours. Um, I think it will be fun. Um, and just one one uh, one information. If you if you have questions, we have a let's say a question tab which where you can write your questions, and we'll try to address them. We, we will try to address them at the end of all presentations, uh, assuming that we have time. Um, so let's move for session number one uh, by Patrick Moller. Um, so I, perhaps I, I suggest that the other colleagues uh, disconnect their cameras while uh, while Patrick is uh, is presenting, if this is the 
if this, I think this is what makes more sense. So Patrick is the CEO of Core Power Ocean, as I said, which is one of the most prominent wave energy developers. Uh, Patrick has been with the company since 2012, built a team of uh, more than 50 people uh, and taking technologies through different uh, stages of verification of, of the technology. Um, Patrick is also a board member of uh, Ocean Energy Europe and the ATIP Ocean uh, Steering Committee. But above all, I guess, Patrick is a passionate uh, entrepreneur um, building deep tech startups from idea to multinational operations. Patrick, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot, Joao, uh, for that kind introduction. And we will try to uh, get some slides up here as well, which is a small IQ test. Uh, organizers, please let me know if I'm sharing my screen now. I am assuming I do, and I will move on with the presentation. Yes. So, Core Power, um, we are a developer of a new type of high efficiency wave energy converters. And um, as said here in the introduction, we're working hard to make this a mainstream energy source that can help the world to transition to 100% renewables. And we see ocean energy taking a key role in, in that transition. Uh, so slightly about core power as a background, we are a OEM, so an equipment developer of a new type of high efficiency wave energy converters. We've been around as a company since 2010. Our head offices are in Stockholm, Sweden, but we're growing a lot in Portugal up in Viana de Castelo at the moment. That's where we are growing uh, most in, in the recent years and the years to come. Uh, what's a bit unique about Core Power is that we have uh, worked along a structured product verification approach in five stages since the beginning. So today we have very solid evidence for the physics and the performance and thereby the competitiveness of uh, the solution, which is starting, I think, to rebuild some uh, credibility and trust into the sector from larger uh, utilities uh, coming back looking at ocean energy as a key piece to uh, make the transition to 100% renewables. So we see wave energy being uh, extremely exciting. It's one of the largest untapped sources of clean energy out there. We're talking about 500 gigawatts, so around 10% of global electricity uh, demand can be satisfied. So about the same opportunity as all the nuclear capacity of the world today or all the hydro capacity. So it's huge, but what really makes it interesting, it's a very complementary and consistent uh, power profile, which could be used to um, complement and, and fill out the gaps when it's not windy and not sunny in future electricity systems. And the, the key markets around the world, I would say, is located around the, the, the big oceans. So in Europe, it's the west coast of the Atlantic. And uh, in the US and Canada, especially the west coast has uh, amazing wave resource. And um, what is interesting there is when you have big oceans with weather systems working up the waves for several days, fetching the energy from the winds into the oceans, is working like a, a huge storage unit. It's concentrating the energy flow. And then based on weather systems gathered over several days, you're then delivering waves to the coasts. Uh, and there is a very low correlation between the wind of the day and the waves of the day or even the hour coming in. So looking at a typical production profile, this is an example from uh, California with 2018 data, actual production of wind and solar and simulated production based on wave boy data of wave. Uh, what can be said about wave energy, it is that it's much more predictable. You know a few days in advance what's coming in, but especially it's very consistent. So looking at a weekly profile like this example here, a week in October, you can see a much more flat production profile. So that is very valuable when we're trying to get to 100% renewables as you need some type of base load to fill out the gaps when it's not windy and not sunny. And because of this, we're seeing that wave energy and tidal energy could have a higher value in future electricity markets. So we would like to remind that we should view the ocean not only as a source of clean energy, but also possibly as one of the largest storage units out there, which is there to help us to balance the future uh, electricity systems. So big message there, ocean energy should be seen as a clean source of energy and a huge storage unit. 
the big challenge with wave energy, though, why don't we see any commercial deployment of it yet in the world? Well, the real challenge is to design a device which is robust enough to survive the toughest storms, at the same time produce enough electricity to make it a viable business case. And historically, wave energy converters have either broken in storms or simply not produced enough electricity to make it a viable business case. But that is a picture that modern wave energy converters are greatly changing. We have introduced a new type of phase controlled high efficiency wave energy converters that gives a very different view on that. Uh, this is our recent C3 device. This was a half scale machine, uh, 4.2 meter in diameter that we tested up in the Orkney Islands in EMEC between 2015 and 2018. We've introduced a few new key features into wave energy to make it competitive. The first one is survivability in storms using a transparent protection mode. So our devices in the natural state, they don't react to waves coming in. Uh, unless we actively control it, the devices are just sitting there uh, here you can see a 50 knot storm, individual waves up to four meters, so equivalent to eight meter waves in a full scale system. Uh, the boy is simply just sitting there, it's not moving up and down, it's not moving to the side, it's letting the waves pass by in its natural state. And this is very similar to a wave, a wind turbine pitching the blades in storm. Every commercial turbine on the market has that capacity. And that has been missing in wave energy, that's one of the features we have introduced. Secondly, we have introduced advanced phase control technology that puts these boys in optimal timing with each incoming wave. That strongly amplifies the motion and thereby the power capture. And by using phase control, we can get a large amount of energy out from a relatively small low-cost device. So combining these features together, survivability and highly efficient production, you can get a large amount of energy with a fairly small low-cost device that really drives down the capex. Also having compact lightweight devices makes it possible to lift, transport, install and service these devices using simple low-cost cranes, ports, vessels, and that really drives down the OPEX side of it. And together it contributes to very competitive uh, cost of energy calculations. So we have a clear path down towards 30 euros per megawatt hour with this technology. And combining that with a larger value in future markets because of a larger extent delivering electricity when it's needed in the systems uh, speaks for a attractive business case going forward. Uh, all these numbers are based on cutting it edge resource, uh, research since the 70s, as, as mentioned here in the introduction. Uh, the specific phase control technology that we're using is based on research from Trondheim University, conducted by first Johannes Faulkner's groups and later by our lead scientist Jürgen Hals, Tudelshaug, who is really changing the, uh, the physics for how much you can absorb with a certain amount of technology. We have proven the physics and the hydrodynamic performance and then built larger and larger machines over the years in a structured product verification approach. So we started small actually in, in Porto in stage one with tank testing and then built larger and larger system in stage two. We went to France to do tank testing and we built quite many generations of benchtop prototypes and land-based machines that we tested in rigs. Then in stage three, we built our first fully integrated wave energy converter, which was the half-scale C3 machine. We first took that through dry testing in Sweden with simulated waves and then we went to EMEC in Orkney to test it in the ocean, measured survivability and very tight production between estimated uh, expected values and actual measured production. So today we are in stage four, building our first full scale system, which is currently built together. It will be dry tested here in Sweden during uh, the spring uh, of the next year, and it should be installed in the ocean in Portugal uh, in the second part of 2021. We're going to then have one cycle of learning on, on that machine and then build three more devices and add them into a pilot array. So we get four full-scale devices together with a floating collection hub uh, exporting power to the Portuguese grid. So by 2024, having that pilot array operating for at least 8,000 hours, we aim to achieve a type certified bankable technology that we can start shipping to customers in volume. Uh, the installation we're doing in Portugal is being done at the Agusadora site. So we're using the existing uh, Agusadora substation in collaboration with Wavec and EDP. 
And here we will first install the first C4 device in the second part of next year, and then add on three more devices into a pilot array, as mentioned, together with a floating collection hub that collects the electricity from the various machines and exports the electricity to the Portuguese grid. In parallel with this, we're building up our capacity for uh, final assembly and servicing of the machines in our machine hall in Viana do Castelo, just north of uh, Agusadora. And the product we're trying to demonstrate here is actually a cluster of 10 megawatts. So we are designing and optimizing our products for the collection of energy from some 20 to 30 devices together with the collection hub, anchoring and cabling to give a cost-effective and reliable method to sell clusters of 10 megawatt plus to various developers of, of uh, farms around the world. And our business model is of an OEM. So we're offering the devices themselves, Wave Farm Engineering Services, as well as uh, service contracts to our target customers, which are typically project developers and utility companies from around the world. And then we are collaborating with uh, EPCs and vessel owners for the installation and the servicing activities uh, of that. Uh, quite many of these customers today are starting to look at the opportunity of combining offshore wind and wave. And the graph I showed in the beginning of the presentation really is the big reason for that. There's a really exciting opportunity to combine, especially floating wind and wave energy devices there, where you can make use of the natural time shift between the resources and export a more consistent, less varying um, flow of electricity through the same cables. You can share the capex of the export infrastructure. You can also share the cost of project development and the consenting and offer a more competitive product in, in the market. So uh, we invite more people to work with us of understanding the opportunities of combining these sources. Uh, going forward. We are building out our team to be able to supply this in volume in the future. Today we are a team of a bit more than 50 people, so possibly one of the largest teams in, in WAVE. And uh, our Portuguese activities is headed by Miguel Silva, who we're very happy to have on the team since the beginning of this year. So Miguel is a wind industry veteran who has ramped up production of wind turbines uh, around the world. Most recently, he was the head of the Portuguese operations for Enercom and the Blade uh, facility in Viana. So he is now leading our team in, in Portugal based on uh, Viana de Costello. And while we are demonstrating the technology here in our Highway 5 program, we are equally also demonstrating the supply chain capacity. And in Sweden, we're building out the capacity to do the uh, inside, the, the uh, drivetrains, the PTOs, and in Portugal, the composite manufacturing and the final assembly and servicing. So we've invested in full-scale facilities in Sweden to be able to assemble PTOs and to do dry testing. We just commissioned a large dry test rig of about 7.2 megawatts of power together with ABB. So this will be operational here by the end of the year. In January, we will start operating it full-scale. It might be one of the largest facilities for dry testing and here we're going to stabilize our full-scale machines, make them uh, reliable before we send them to Portugal for integration in the boy hulls. And in the port of Viana do Costello, we are building out a facility for R&D in composite hulls and for final assembly of the wave devices. So here you see the current status of our machine hulls. This week it actually got roofing and walls coming on the uh, machine hull as well. So it's one week old picture we're looking at here. And we're investing in a mobile factory concept for the production of our wave hulls. And the technology we're demonstrating here is based on a container-based filament winding machines for producing the composite hulls. And our vision here for the future is to demonstrate the capability of fabricating the hulls locally. And the supply chain, we will move these machines from site to site with customers and produce the hulls locally once a certain amount of hulls have been produced for a farm, we then move the machines further to the next customer site. So instead of shipping boys around the world, we move the machines to make the boys there. Uh, so finishing off by saying that ocean energy really is the big opportunity in renewable energy going forward. It's a huge opportunity out there and there are technologies coming online which are both reliable and becoming 
competitive. And we're very excited to work on this in Portugal. And we hope to see more on the West Coast on Canada going forward as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, hi, dear João. We are not able to hear you, so um, maybe you should uh, see if the audio is connected, please. João, no, we are not able to hear you. May I ask you to um, turn off your microphone and camera uh, and sound, please? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, João. Okay, sorry for this uh, minor technical problem. Guess it's solved. Patrick, I was saying uh, thank you very much for your interesting presentation and the and, uh, perfect timing. Um, I would now like to call to the stage UC Ackerberg uh, for, the next, for the next session. I guess we'll address questions in the end. Um, so UC is the, the CTO of AW Energy, uh, which is, a, let's say, a world leading wave energy company. Um, Juicy has a, a strong industrial background with already 20 years of experience in demanding multidisciplinary R&D projects. Um, he has worked with uh, AW Energy since, since 2011 and since 2018 he is the, the, the Chief Technology Officer. Um, before that, Juicy had a, well, a technical career, always in the, let's say, in the green area. Uh, initially with Vizala on weather measurements and later with ABB developing their central solar inverters from concept to, to market. Um, you see, you have a very interesting uh, presentation ahead. Uh, the title is Wave Roller from Demo to Customer Asset. I'm looking forward to, to hear about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, you probably can hear me. Uh, I will now do the same rehearsal as the previous speaker, as Patrick. So let's see how I yes, fine. Su succeed to share my screen. I expect you can see that now. Uh, okay, thank you, first of all, for Wavec for inviting me here. It's an honor and a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I hope all is well in these exceptional times. As introduced, my name is Jussi Okerberg, and I come from a company called AW Energy. Uh, last year, I had the pleasure to present in this event the deployment of an industrial sized wave roller unit in Portugal in Peniche. Today, I'm going to take a bit broader view to tell you how we are building the path toward wave farms and real customer assets. Uh, we have been growing our expertise of wave energy in Portugal since 2007. The green device you see in the picture was launched in pennies then. And uh, in this connection, I want to express my gratitude of the continuous support of municipality of, of pennies and the local people. We can be proud of what we have achieved together there. Uh, okay, but the starting point for this story is the demo unit, as we call it. Demo was a technology demonstration carried out from uh, 2012 to 2014 in Penish, Portugal. There was three individual 100 kilowatt machine rooms combined into a single platform. We got to test many of the solutions used also today. And uh, based on the performance data, then we got third party validation of the power production. 
Um, and uh, <clears throat> so this is where the real story begins. Please don't be puzzled of the multitude of things in the timeline in this slide. The slide describes what is required to get the certification of the device in place. The certification part is running below the timeline in the slide and, and ending on the right hand side to a prototype certificate. The certification is one of the ways to convince the customers and investors. It's the way to get the necessary business interruption insurances in place for a real commercial site. And I will explain now some of the things we have done along the way to the certification. At the same time with launching technology qualification planning, we launched the design of a novel wave roller device and design of a test bench for testing the PTO on dry land. In the PTO test facility, we could proceed with functional testing as well as performance and reliability testing and uh, on the side also design of new prime mover and, and foundation was ongoing. Uh, but our goal of course was further away to deploy an industrial scale device which we call the first of a kind. But before we can launch the device there is a lot of details to cover like site permitting related things and and procurement manufacturing quality of production production testing certification inspection logistics and transportation planning and handling of heavy lifting and final assembly and 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 safety guidelines around that the very important thing here is not only what you do but also how you do it. We are continuously improving the ways to do things. We got the company certificate for ISO 9001 in place in 2016 and it has been reviewed yearly since then. Uh, just as an example of one of the items to be done in the long list, what it means to build a supply chain. In first of a kind device there where components from all over Europe, like Finland, Portugal, Italy, UK, and also a bit further away, like from Canada and China. But it is imperative to get the supply chain uh, in place to be able to launch even, even bigger uh, sites in the future. With first of a kind, we also took planning and implementation of marine operations to a new level. Subsea cable installation and electrical connections at sea, but also, of course, towing the device, submerging it and all the related diving operations. Needless to say, but also risk assessments and related safety guidelines around the operations are very important. We got also invaluable experience of commissioning and what it takes to monitor and adjust the first of a kind device in production. Actually, we were quite well prepared for that. We have a fully functional remote control room in Finland, but we can also monitor the device from any mobile device using iOS operating system. And uh, our alarm system can redirect the notification as SMS to any mobile device. The emphasis with first of a kind has been in survivability. The grid connection was established and the device started to feed the grid at significant wave height of seven meters. That was the starting point for commissioning. The biggest waves it has faced have been over 12 meters and it has been installed now over a year. Um, regular, regular diving inspections have been a part of the operations as well. The inspections not only monitors the device 
but also its environment. And in relation to that, we are participating to a, a wave energy in Southern Europe, VESE EU funded project. One part of the work plan of the project is assessing the effects of first of a kind device in Peniche. Things to monitor there are, for example, seabed integrity, sound environment, and, and EMC effects. Uh, in another EU funded project, the Mega Roller, we are partly using experiences from the first of a kind to increase the unit power, enhance the power capture further, and, and continue working on reliability among uh, lots of other things. Uh, Mega Roller project is in most part still focusing on a single device and especially on the PTO. But I'm excited to say this. There's still another EU funded project we have just started a bit over a month ago and it will go far beyond that thinking. Focus is in preparing for real customer projects by preparing to launch wave farms instead of individual devices and all the related processes, contracts, documentation and so on. So preparing to provide a customer solution. Uh, we, are, we are aiming uh, to go uh, and, and uh, install in the first phase to 24 integrated wave roller units and uh, the work we will be doing in this project will assist securing eight wave farm projects globally uh, that will deliver the capacity of 150 megawatts, which is a significant amount of installed capacity. Okay, this customer solution is the next step on the way to a customer asset. Asset here is something that the customers are ready to invest in as it provides profit. And I think this is one of the key points to be achieved in, in wave energy as well. Just to summarize a bit what I've told you here of, of our approach our consistent way of building the stage towards the customer asset. Um, the next step in the stairways is always building on the previous ones. Starting from demonstration unit, through certification and testing uh, in the test facility, to deployment of first of a kind, taking the learnings from the real CI environment with the uh, new generation device, uh, getting that le those learnings and, and, and enhancing those in, in mega roller, in VESE projects, and, and bringing all this knowledge that we have on the background to wave farm project is the target. And uh, that is the way to a real customer asset. I would say failures are inevitable and successes are needed. The important thing here is to take whatever learnings one is given and, and to really learn and to push on. I, I think uh, uh, wave energy has a bright future ahead. That is all I have to say today. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Yusi. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for, for the very interesting presentation. Also keeping up with the time, it's in a little bit shorter than, than, than your slot. Um, so I would like, like now call to the stage uh, Fred Gardner. Um, so, so Fred Gardner is uh, as a background as in electrical and mechanical engineering, as well as a technical education teacher. Um, he has designed fast production processes since 1980, uh, and in 1993 he started Teamwork Technology. 
And since then, he has been developing several companies and, company and concepts. Let me just add that Fred Gardner is, is uh, I guess, uh, you all know, uh, one of the most important thinkers and doers in the wave energy sector. So I'm very glad to, to, to give you the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I have never been mentioned like this, but uh, I feel really proud. Um, yes, we, we have uh, quite some experience in the past, and uh, like the, the previous speakers who, who show uh, very much uh, what, what is the task to put something into the uh, ocean and, and, and what's needed and what steps are needed. And I think this is what we learned from, uh, uh, like, like uh, Joseph was saying, by trial and error. Uh, and more and more we see it uh, coming to a very professional way of doing it, taking small steps, doing your calculations, doing your testings, and in the meantime, um, building up. Uh, market and 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 uh, and uh, strategies to bring products into the market. Um, like you said, I have uh, quite some experience um, that comes with age, I suppose. Uh, the 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 we we did something in Portugal before. Uh, we did something with wind turbines. We set up a wind turbine company. We set up tidal turbine, and. Um, we said wave up, up wave energy before. I will show this all in the presentation, uh, but the main aspect in all this is cooperation, I think. And we are proud to say that we have uh, already a 25 years of cooperation with Portugal. And uh, on the picture, you see our king and queen and our minister uh, being in, uh, in uh, Lisbon uh, two, two, two years ago where we signed and, and LOE to really develop together uh, test facilities and, and research on wave energy. And uh, apart from me, there are uh, people from the Sinus Harbor and the, the, one of the directors of WaveEc uh, signing this contract. Can I? Okay, I can switch to the next. Uh, the, the technology we're working on now is uh, the uh, Symphony Wave Power. Um, this should look something like uh, what you see here in the picture. It's underwater. You don't see anything, which is an advantage, but I can tell you for commercial uh, activities, it's a disadvantage because nobody can see it. Um, and there will be arrays or matrices of devices before the cost goes. So many small devices. And I would like to take you through the steps we have done and where we are going. So this started already. Uh, I I'm missing the the lower part of the slide. Is don't know what's happening. Because on underneath are the years, and the most left picture I think is uh, 1993, uh, uh, and then in the middle one you see the below the the young guy. It's me, where we did first testing on, on wave energy. I think it was 1997. And then in uh, 1999, we went to Ireland and repeated a lot of testing. And because at uh, the University of Cork, they have a lot of experience. And at that time, we founded a, a nice facility to really calibrate all the computer models. And then in uh, 2004, we uh, built and installed a device uh, actually at the same cable in Acusadora, the cable we put in as part of the project uh, where later other devices have been testing like uh, ocean power and uh, of uh, Palamas and, uh, and other wind turbine technologies. The left picture shows the device. It was a huge device. We built it in, uh, this was in Romania, in Galati. And the middle picture is showing the device during submersion. The device had the, the only the, the center part was 10 meters diameter and uh, had a, a generator of two megawatts. Um, it, I, I suggest it was a bit following the wind industry. Everybody wants to see megawatts. So our investor said, let's build megawatts. 
we did it. We put it on the seabed, completely submerged. And the, the picture on the right is people we are still working with, uh, Frank Neumann, uh, who's uh, still working with us now in uh, in, in Sinus. And at that time, he was working for Wavec, and we wanted an independent uh, uh, observer. And Miguel Prado is still working with us. And they were sitting here in the control cabin where we had uh, the full connection to the grid. And we run the device for uh, a number of months to check on, on the models. And we learned a lot and a lot of things we didn't want to learn. So. Just to go from there, because uh, the, the, the old company, a AWS, uh, we sold. It's, it's still a, a company which is uh, in Inverness at the moment, and they're still working on, on Wave Energy. And we were, uh, at that time, we, we thought, uh, especially since we were based in the Netherlands, there's no market for Wave Energy in the Netherlands. That's what we thought at that time. But uh, in the meantime, we found that there is really a good market for wave energy, even in North Sea and other uh, seas, especially uh, on small devices and for uh, learning, because I think that's what we learned from the first project, do things step by step. So the, the new concept uh, works in the same way of extracting the energy. So it's a submerged uh, device, which is underwater, about five meters underwater in the, in the main position. And what we did in this project is that we redesigned the interior. And uh, the idea is to keep it as simple as possible. It's in what we call the power takeoff system. And this is uh, what you see is happening. This is the size of the first device we're building at the moment. And let's see the next slide. It shows. It should be in an animation. Let's see if that starts to. Okay. Help me. Jeanette, can you put yes, it on again? Uh, yes, just one second, please. Yes. Maybe skip that slide. Maybe the 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 GIF is given. There's a uh, there's a problem with the screen. Just one second, please. In the meantime, I can tell you it's uh, like uh, what Patrick was explaining. We have a, an, a, a resonating device which has a face control. It's extremely important to have face controls that, so that your motion is well adapted to the, the waypoint. It can be a difference of 200 to 300%. The resonance is uh, created by adding a spring to your okay. system. So what you okay. have in classic uh, mechanical engineering, a, a dense mass spring system. And the damper is the, the generator. And the spring inside is an air spring. And we added two very innovative uh, parts in the technology. And these parts are a roll membrane which has a lot of functions and um, and a, a special turbine. Um, this is not what you want. You know, if you want to develop a new technology, try not to, to stack on each other innovations. But uh, after our first experience, we thought, let's first focus on new innovations in the power takeoff system before we go into the sea. And we had this opportunity um, in uh, in one of the uh, the uh, PD proposals, which we did together with uh, Wayfac. Jeanette, is uh, anything working? <laughs> Fred, um, this is uh, João. I, w I, w I would suggest that you skip the animation slide. I mean, it seems there seems to be some issue with the presentation. If if you yes, don't mind, the, the, the presentation is run from Lisbon because we ah, thought okay, it, okay. it would give less problems. So okay, thank you. But, you know, this is just what happens when you... Jeanette, can you tell us what's happening? To put it on a, on a computer. Okay. The, the computer blocked. Okay, I'll keep back. I know what are the slides, so maybe we can go back to them later. Uh, so I'm telling you the, the, the two uh, 
innovative parts of this uh, device is the the uh, roll membrane which is inside in the turbine and we uh, made out steps to uh, to to de-risk this, this design so in in the uh, one of the in, in the past we had the wet feet wet feet was a european program with a lot of partners in in europe and there we could uh, design and test it to to two components so the roll membrane was actually built and tested and uh, yeah this is this that that slide before Jeanette, is very nice can i go back to it uh can you can you check if you can uh, see the presentation now i see the presentation and you can control it uh no Cannot control it. The slide you see now is the turbine. Uh, left is the 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 three D drawing. In the middle, the uh, the efficiencies we expect, which are above ninety percent. And on the right, you see uh, the white uh, prototype, which is the turbine. And this one is tested at the moment in Cines in Portugal, on a uh, Portuguese program base point together with uh, Portuguese companies. Yeah. Okay, this is the next slide. Um, uh, in a, but I, if possible, I would like to go back two slides. Is that possible? Otherwise, I just continue. Here you see the the, the turbine again uh, with the people working on it. Frank Neumann is uh, and 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 Joost at the right. What we do here is we have the turbine between two pressure vessels and we can run it like this in the in the ocean. So it runs for uh, four seconds or up to to five or six seconds in one direction, and then it uh, reverses and runs in the other direction. In the meantime, we can check on all the components and on the controls uh, so we have the full control in place and we're doing all the testing on the on the turbine itself and for that we already found some some problems in the turbine we had a, a gear wheel broken like that and then you're really happy that you're in a workshop when it happens because you don't want to repair a gearbox uh, or a gear wheel uh, at sea so uh, once it, the device will go at sea, then the turbine has been tested for many, many hours. I think it's it's uh, more or less what uh, Patrick showed with with uh, their system. Uh, check your PTO and and run it and run it and run it and punish it until it uh, really goes uh, the way you want it to go. And we are in that stage at the moment. So we're going to the next step, which is the dry test. Can you put the next slide up? That's the previous one. Maybe the next. Okay. Yeah, this, this is a nice slide. Thank you. Uh, what you see here is the dry test, which we are building now. We have now a new subsidy uh and core and the idea is to uh pick up the 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 turbine which is in the, the middle of the device um the, the the right picture would have been a nice uh animation but you can't see it so what will happen is that uh you see three pictures at the left uh, one is two meters below the center point and one is two meters above the center point and between the the outside and the inside we see the roll membrane and the roll membrane uh, has several functions it's the bearing so it keeps two two uh, units uh, separate from each other but it's a piston as well the the upper roll membrane is a bit wider than the lower one so it pushes water through the turbine into the center tank and the center tank is a spring is the air is inside which creates a spring and this spring can be uh, by the amount of 
uh, air we put in there, we can tune this spring to make it resonant with the waves. And for a half a meter wave, we can already run it up and down two meters, creating a, a point absorber uh, thing. Maybe it's not, you see there is a, a, a play button on the, on the screen, not the, the, the right uh, picture. Can you touch that? Okay, well. We... Is it okay like this? Sorry. Next slide. Well, the, the green screen below, if you go down with the cursor, yeah you will see at the bottom yeah there you will see if you go up no if you go up a little bit yeah if you maybe it will work yes this is nice so here you see what happens when the device runs up and down it pushes i think it we were lucky just one cycle it pushes the water inside and that creates uh, pressure and then the pressure will push it back and this is the nice thing of what we built now is that it has actually only two critical components. So the rubber membrane and the turbine, and for the rest there's hardly any technology inside. And that is what I think we need. So the device will be one and a half meter diameter and the, the, the energy will be produced by putting many systems in the, in the water. Maybe I can have the next slide. Yes. Well, we are in a, a more or like same uh, process. At the moment, we are doing a technology uh, qualification. The Encore project is done with uh, uh, Bureau Veritas. So we are working on the certification of the whole device. And, uh, and at the main time, same time, we are working on the, on the business model and how to introduce this technology into the world. And I can tell you that's just as difficult as creating the technology because you have to take steps there and work in the triple helix to get it done. That's why we have a very heavy involvement with the local governments because we are telling the local governments, you know, you can have these devices in front and visible into the sea, or you can have many wind turbines in the dunes. And it's the Netherlands is a heavy populated area. We have hardly any places where you can put wind turbines where nobody sees it. Maybe the next test, next uh, slide. And this is the, the for, for many of you, I think it's new. What you see in the middle is uh, the core that we are building like on, the, on the, the right picture. And what we will do, we will build in the future another core. So the, the left one is what we are building now. The right one is in the future, and we add at the outside uh, the, uh, an extra hole, which gives a lot of extra energy coming in, and it's a very low cost part of your construction. So I think it's a similar like with core power, you have uh, an, a central area, which means all the, all the systems, and then it's uh, a buoy at the outside. The only big difference here is we are on the water, and they are at the, at the water level, but I think the similarities are great and it would be great to share knowledge and uh, see how we push this forward. Ocean is big enough to put many systems in there. Next slide, please. Yes, great. Uh, so this is what we are, are talking about, site development. So while we are still uh, testing the, the, the PTO and the and the dry test, we are already talking with uh, municipalities, and this is one of the islands in the north of the Netherlands. And here we want to put the five megawatt park. And with the five megawatt park, we can produce all the uh, energy for the inhabitants of the island of Tessel. So although the, the wave energy in the Netherlands is just a few percent of the, the national uh, grid, it is for the, the, the coastal municipalities. It can be, you know, half or all of the energy that they need. So, like uh, we said, we are going to do a, a wet test first. Wet test will be one device putting in the water, and we are looking very much for uh, seniors to do that. If you show the next uh, slide, this gives the steps we want to make. So we are working now in the harbor of seniors. And the nice thing of Phoenix, it's very sheltered area because uh, 
uh, we want to put one step between the dry test and the, and the, and the, and the ocean or the big uh, exposed test, which is a test in the harbor where we will test all the systems. Uh, we can run the device up and down, even in still water. When that you can really test all your systems and when once that really works, we will go to a more exposed area. And that could be uh, again in Acusadora or uh, at the North Sea. And maybe even in two steps, uh, we could go at the North Sea first with a small device and then in the meantime develop the big device for the ocean coast. So like I said, we want to go to the first part of uh, five megawatts. You see it in the steps below. And then the, the, the market in the Netherlands, we believe, is about 500 megawatts. And that will be about 4,000 systems. At the end of this 4,000 systems, we will be very competitive with wind. And we can uh, produce at 7 cents per kilowatt hour. Next slide, which is the last one. So if you want ever to connect us, you can find us here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, I apologize for the technical issues that we that we faced. Um, we are now slightly ahead of of our schedule, but I mean I think we we can we can still manage. So next on the floor we have uh, uh, Simon Di Pietro uh, from DP Energy. Simon is a a graduate in mechanical engineering from uh, uh, University of Liverpool. Um, he started his, his career as a gas turbine engineer and uh, joined his mother Maureen in DP Energy in the early 90s. Um, since then, Simon has been developing renewable energy projects in Ireland, the United Kingdom, Australia and Canada, uh, and has a lot of hands-on experience on every aspect of, of, let's say, project development, including grid issues, construction and financing. Um, Simon is also president of, of uh, co-president of Ocean Energy Europe and a member of Marine Energy Canada. Uh, I guess now we'll have a different perspective. We, uh, up to now, we had, let's say, the technology developer perspective, and now we have the project developer perspective. Thank you, Simon. Uh, thank you, everybody, and, and good morning, hopefully. Um, hopefully, you can see my screen OK. So, um, yes. as Good, okay. So, uh, as Jeff said, I'm going to talk slightly differently, I think, which is actually um, as introduced as a project developer. Um, and I think that does put a slightly different perspective on things, uh, but I'll come to that as we go through the slides. So, uh, let me know if I'm having technical issues, which I immediately am. Sorry, go with me. Simon. May I ask you to put on presentation mode because we are seeing the next slide you're presenting, please. Okay, let me. Does that work? Uh, I think that you, that we are seeing your, let's say, your secondary screen. Uh, I presume you are working with two screens, right? Yeah. Because we we see, let's say the let's say the operational dashboard with the. Yeah, bear with me. Is that any better, gentlemen, ladies? Um, yes, Simon, thank you. Okay. Um, hopefully that will, I, I may have to ask you to step in. I did a rather poor job of presenting my slides at OEE the other day, so. Uh, so just just to come back to it, so DP Energy is a project developer, um, not a device developer. We are technology neutral. Um, I think, as you can see with the slides, wind, um, solar, tidal, wave, um, all, all of the above. Uh, key markets, just I think important for this uh, sort of little conference is obviously uh, you can see Canada fairly substantially in blue there, uh, an island blue in small, but uh, I'm sat to you talking from Cork. Uh, and as you know, the Cork resource or the, the West Coast resource of Ireland is massive. Uh, but I'll touch on, on technologies as a developer mode and, and see how that goes. So, so just putting a, a developer hat on and thinking about um, perspectives, um, I think there's a couple of interesting slides here. Um, the first one I think that's interesting from a Canadian perspective is we already do have a Canadian footprint. Um, and on the top left and bottom left, you can see 
uh, a solar and wind project we're, where we're already sat uh, developing renewables across Canada. Um, and I'll come to our tidal piece in Nova Scotia shortly. Um, and then top right, I think, is an interesting project. Uh, it's interesting because in the same way that combining wind and wave opportunity is interesting, uh, we have hybrid approach to generation. Um, so from a developer's perspective in terms of financing, what's important is value of power and how that power is delivered to grid. Uh, and I think as you can see in this instance, we have 50, uh, 50 wind turbines generating uh, you know, 210, 220 megawatts uh, plus a solar. Uh, and what's interesting about that is it's got a, a diurnal wind pattern and obviously a diurnal solar pattern. Um, so that gives you quite an interesting daytime profile, uh, which actually, when we start thinking about power, also obviously relates to the whole wind and wave uh, and tidal perspective. So that's that's an, a theme I would like to come back to. Oops. So just touching on the uh, project developer's perspective of what industrialization means, um, I'm heartened to hear sort of like the words of product uh, verification of of certification and essentially uh, what we ultimately want is a financeable uh, insurable product um, which obviously is cost competitive um, and obviously manufacturers have that view as well but we I guess I would think from a development perspective uh, looking at an end user who will likely be a, a utility uh, or an equivalent uh, or an equivalent investor perhaps pension funds when we get to commercial uh, market scale projects and with enough uh, water sorry, enough devices in the water, um, having something which looks like a real industry. So for me, uh, or for us, let's say uh, that means without grant, it means with uh, at least three or four OEMs that can provide a competitive market um, position so that we know that we're getting best value for money and the lowest LCOE, um, and likewise for installation contractors, and then ultimately for O&M service providers. Um, and that obviously mimics very much uh, where wind is and, and solar PV is now. So, so that's what we're looking for for an industrial product. So if I jump on to, uh, as I said, we're already in Canada. Um, we will, I'm hoping, be in, in Ireland fairly soon with some wave. Um, but if I pick up on Canada and, and focus on that for a moment, uh, we have a nine megawatts of feed-in tariff and, and seabed uh, in force in the Bay of Fundy, uh, Nova Scotia. Um, fairly phenomenal um, tide flows of, of six meters a second on springs. Um, fascinating site, uh, challenging, uh, and one of the few places in the world with fairly scaly uh, tidal ranges as well. So we have a, a 13 meter uh, tidal range, which obviously gives you some challenges. So, so this is this is our lead project. Uh, this is obviously not a fully industrial project. Um, we've got some good availability expectations and good capacity factors. Um, but at nine megawatts, you know, in terms of uh, where we're looking at wind and solar, that's a small project. So, so stepping on, um, so I, I'll touch on force. Jason may mention this this later. Um, so this is our piece of seabed. This is where we are. Um, and I think perhaps just on this this point about um, supportive uh, nature necessary to actually deliver these early stage projects, which are not yet industrial projects. So this, this has been very well supported by uh, provincial government in Nova Scotia, also supported by federal government. Uh, and I think it's a, a sign of the positiveness of, of Canadian uh, forward thinking, to be honest, in terms of a, a requirement for CO2 and a recognition of our, of our obligations to look after the place that we call home. So there's my piece of seabed, um, where we have initially our nine megawatts. Um, alongside that, you can see a number of other berths, uh, and, and here is Jason's little home, uh, and this is all cabled and so forth. So, um, and Fundy Ocean Research Centre um, has been, you know, a, a sort of a, a very instrumental in terms of getting this this away, uh, and we are hoping to make some noise here fairly soon. So the technology we've picked. Um, and then this will perhaps illustrate why we are a, a project developer. Uh, my objective uh, in, this, in this project is to make it the most boring project uh, possible. Um, uh, and the objective of that really is to look at proper finance um, and to try and build a project which essentially um, is not pushing the bounds too far. 
um, as well as bringing on technology from an industrial perspective, uh, we also need to bring on investors. Uh, and of course, we also need to bring on the, um, uh, the environmental regulators. So, so all of these things need to arrive at the same point, hopefully at the same time, uh, but not necessarily. So we would have OEMs focus on delivering uh, an industrial product with warranties, with guarantees, which make the product saleable. Uh, and on the same side, we're trying to convince investors uh, and utilities who are, I think, just picking up on Patrick's point, uh, there is significant interest now, uh, been through some dark days, but I think things are changing. Um, and I think that's really a key point for us is, is as I said, press, press phrasing it, the most boring projects in the world is not exactly what's in my mind. It's far from that. Uh, but clearly, the closer we get to um, something which investors are comfortable with, um, the easier it's going to be to finance and to actually finance the next one and the next one. Uh, and ultimately, that's the goal for a, an industrial project um, is that actually we are at a point of real finance with real debt, uh, no grant money and competitive with other technologies, which I'll, which I'll come on to. Um, so that's basically the um, status of where we are. Um, that's clearly not a turbine. We're doing um, deployment of monitoring equipment to demonstrate that we can monitor uh, properly. And that's a key element coming back to the regulatory piece that the regulators also need to be confident that we can deploy and that we can monitor the devices so that we know we're not doing harm. And obviously that's a key point as well, I think, that that ultimately we're, the reason we're doing it um, is not necessarily pure dollar signs or euro signs. Um, we, we are uh, developers who actually believe that we're doing a good thing. So again, just to, to reiterate that, that point, uh, and obviously I'll, I'll point this all to the, the guys on the on previous um, slide presentations, which were all very good. Um, so my first point is you're too expensive. Uh, you're too expensive to install. Uh, life's not long enough. Not enough energy, too cheap, sorry, it's too expensive to operate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all the usual things you would expect from a customer to complain about uh, as if I was buying a car. Um, but ultimately, that's really where we need to get to, to have uh, an industrial product uh, and also an industrial project. So it's not just about the turbine. Uh, we also need to bring the whole thing from blade tip on a, on a tidal basis. Um, so blade tip to bus bar uh, essentially is the, is the mental mantra we have is that that has to be what's economic. So, uh, credit to Ocean Energy Europe. Um, I think they've done some fantastic job. A lot of very good support from um, OEE, and I suppose I am plugging that a little bit because I am co-president. So I'd be disappointed if I wasn't. Um, but I think there is. Uh, this is a fairly typical um, picture of well, this is how it works. Uh, so I won't talk to this, but I think really there are very clear understandings of what the reduction drivers are, uh, and we won't talk to them specifically. But obviously, there's a uh, that's well understood. So at a project level as opposed to a product level, so I'm now thinking about the project. Uh, obviously, I'm looking for cost reduction. Back to my point, everything's too expensive. Um, you don't make enough energy. Uh, there's not enough energy on the seabed I'm using. Um, and that also brings in the fact that the more energy density I get, the shorter my cable runs are, so I can reduce my balance of plant costs and so forth. So this, this, this whole rounded project view i think means well i can pay more for the for the turbine if it gives me a better energy density per square meter and that actually comes over across on the balance of plant so it's a it's more of a rounded view of what the project economics look like and then ultimately at the bottom there which again is a big one i think is reducing installation and maintenance so so technically um if i if i switch into a slightly into a manufacturing mode um, clearly, what we would expect to see from a, a manufacturer is, is components that just work. Um, that means that, that, for example, on the first point, we're not designing for 300 meters when actually we're in 35, 40 meters of water. Um, we're also looking for volume uh, as well. So the whole point about uh, mass production and in industrialization is that people will design components rather than use um, components which are uh, one-off bespokes. Uh, and then we can start to say, well, actually, now we can see volume uh, affecting value or costs. Similarly, um, from a, an industrialization perspective, instead of, uh, if I take the Andritz uh, example, instead of the units being made in a factory which is making uh, other hydro equipment, um, so there is no dedicated supply line, there's no dedicated team 
Um, obviously, that's not necessarily the cheapest way to make product. So again, there needs to be improvement. And then, and then the obvious one and all of these things is coming back to it's too expensive, it's too heavy, uh, and you don't produce enough power. So that's my, my standard challenge to every OEM. So just touching on a couple of those things, um, you saw the, the um, slide before where we were looking at, uh, as I said, a, a, basically a, a design which looks very similar to what's already been deployed in Majin. Um, this is a, a now a step from that on the left. One of the things we've been looking at is, is pin piling and getting rid of the ballast. Uh, which means you can reduce weights. If you reduce weights, you can reduce lift. Uh, and then further over to the right, you can see a, a monopile foundation. Uh, again, simple rolled structure, uh, rolled welded. And you can then say, well, actually, that's a much simpler structure. It can, again, much lighter, uh, much cheaper. And that also brings in the, uh, the reality that you also now need to think about how do you, how do you mount these things? Do we need a downhole, uh, sorry, subsea drill, uh, such as provided by Bauer? moving quickly on uh, and the other thing we need to do is we need to join these things together um, so we join them together electrically so here's a, a hub subsea hub approach uh, which again comes part of the industrialization it's not just the turbine it's not just the wave device uh, we all also need to join these guys together and we need to send them ashore so there you have atlantis atomic atlantis and a ge product uh, on the methodologies uh, again sabella on the on the left um, and uh, sort of a, the green marine uh, gantry type barge approach on, um, on the right. Again, multi-purpose vessels are expensive uh, and that's a big vessel. In fact, that's not the biggest vessel uh, that's being used to deploy turtle turbines. But again, from a project perspective, industrialization means using assets which are readily available uh, and cheap. And ultimately, uh, when we get to scale, may need to be owned and operated um, by the developer or, or the ultimate owner operator. Sorry, I'm delaying times here, but so, so currently where we are, on our next target is to be down at around uh, 4 million a megawatt. That's, that's a still healthy number, but it's substantially lower than where we are. Um, and we can talk a little bit more of those on questions. Um, you've seen Ocean Energy Europe's um, plans uh, in terms of sector um, decrease on cost. We heard some interesting numbers there from Patrick. Uh, and from some of the other wave manufacturers. And I think that's quite an interesting area. Uh, and particularly when we're looking at sharing cable costs with other manufacturers, uh, sorry, other products such as wind, we can actually see the cover, the, the colors coming down significantly, the numbers coming down significantly. So, so that, you know, just coming back to a, a, an in the round view of things from a project perspective, um, obviously one of the challenges at the moment talking about investors is there are other interesting uh, products that they can invest in, uh, onshore wind, solar, um, batteries. I think batteries are a, uh, a blessing, a challenge at the same time. Uh, the battery pricing, I think Bloomberg has had them falling from uh, a thousand a kilowatt hour to down to sort of something like uh, 150, 160 a kilowatt hour in a space of like eight, nine years. Um, so offshore wind, offshore wind, you know the turbine prices have, have plummeted. The turbines are now becoming massive. Uh, in our own projects, we're looking at 15 megawatt, 18 megawatt machines. Um, and obviously coming back to the energy density question, that becomes an interesting challenge for any new um, nascent industry. Um, solar PV uh, in, the, in the right locations with the right capacity factors, um, some fantastic capacity factors can be got. Um, I think, and we're talking about sort of in the, uh, the 50, 60, uh, Canadian uh, or Australian, so maybe 40 euro cents. And, but it really depends on the market uh, and obviously what your base base yield opportunities are in different markets. So uh, uh, I thought I'd throw in a, a few other devices that are out there that are quite interesting. Uh, we've obviously seen from, from the guys on the previous slide, so Core Power, um, uh, AW Energy and, and sort of Symphony, and, that, and there's a number of others that interest us um, from our futures. Uh, on this one, also throwing in sort of a couple of other names. So there's, there's MPS, there's Bombora, uh, SBM's uh, wave device, and then FPP. And, and again, this is a challenge, but also an opportunity. Um, so I think the, the onset of hybrids, which is where I started, uh, and coming to the point that the guys made about balanced energy delivery, uh, what actually matters is the cost of energy of the overall system, uh, not any individual component. And for me, an industrialized product means an industrialized product, which is the gigawatt hours that come out the back, 
um, how they're generated, provide they're sustainable, green, and don't do harm. Uh, it probably doesn't really matter. Uh, but certainly the hybrid co-location or, or co-device employment of, of sort of marine along with wind is going to be a fascinating area going forward. So uh, thank you for that. So that's some challenges, but that was just a project developer's view. And uh, uh, my apologies. Yeah, I think I slightly overran, but hopefully not too far. Thank you. João Maciel, uh, again, we cannot uh, hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, just fine. Thank you. Okay, same issue again. So I was saying, uh, let me call to the to the stage Jason Ayman. Um, so Jason has been declared the winner of this year's Vimaris Industry Award. Uh, he's at the helm of uh, sustainable marine energy since 2009 uh, and developing tidal uh, devices through the different demonstration phases, uh, gearing up to install one of the world's foremost tidal energy projects in Canada. Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, let me just, uh, the screen here. Okay, just need to make sure I've got the right one. Okay, are you seeing the uh, presentation full screen? Not yet. No. Uh, hold on one second. Ready, share my screen. Okay, how about now? Uh, I think it's again the same issue, that, which is the secondary screen, which is being shared. That's fine. And okay. Yeah, fine. There we go. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you. It's um, <laughs> yeah, thank you for the for the introduction. Yeah, it was certainly uh, a surprise to to win the award this year, but but, but much appreciated, and I uh, very much appreciate the chance to to speak here today. Um, this event is is a, a nexus of all the all the places I like um, because of course we're delivering uh, a very substantial project in Canada um, but I'm actually uh, coming to you today from Qashqai where I, I like to spend as much time as we can even though uh, we're based in Edinburgh and of course we have offices in, in, in Germany as well. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about sustainable marine energy and our journey to get to where we are today and um, yeah, I suppose pick up on some of the other threads which have already been mentioned in terms of where we need to go to deliver uh, commercially viable ocean energy. In, in our case, we, we are in the tidal energy game, uh, much like Simon, and somehow we've uh, we'll, we'll come to it, but we've become um, not only a technology developer, but also a project developer along the way, because uh, I think that needs to happen in the, in the early days. Um, so just to uh, give you a brief intro, um, so we are really about putting things uh, into an energetic marine environment that are going to provide power for island and coastal communities. In our case, that's tidal energy solutions. Uh, we see that there is, a, a, although geographically specific, um, a great number of coastal communities around the world um, that have some amazing tidal resource on the doorstep. And Nova Scotia, Canada is, uh, is an excellent example of that. And this is our uh, demonstration platform. Interestingly enough, you can actually see it's got some solar on top of a wind turbine, so maybe one of the first hybrid power systems. Uh, but it survived, um, uh, you know, storms and 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 harsh winters. Uh, it's been deployed here in Grand Passage for testing for two years, and before that, it did a winter in, on the west coast of Scotland. So uh, we've had a, a lot of experience um, performing maintenance and uh, on the device. And that is all, uh, all that learning has been captured and rolled up into our, our, our new system, the 6.40, which I'll tell you a bit more about, which is going to be headed up to force uh, next year in 2021 as the first device and part of uh, what should be the world's first floating tidal array. Um, so if we, oh, sorry, what's happening here? Uh, let's see if we can move it on. There we go. Right, so. 
Um, yeah, so when we started off, uh, so as you mentioned, I've been in this game since 2009. In, initially, we were doing engineering and, and, uh, and working for other developers. So I, I ran the, the installation of VoIP Hydro's uh, tidal turbine out in Korea in 2009-10. Um, and uh, which was a first generation gravity based system, much like the Android system that Simon just showed you. Um, and, and what we've learned is just that handling, doing all this lifting is, is, out at sea is very expensive. And Simon mentioned the, the, the push there to, to remove the weight of the, of the lifts. So, so we started going down the road of looking at buoyancy based solutions. And initially, we started developing a, a mid water column system um, called Plato. Um, and designed a position uh, beneath the surface uh, where it was out of sight and uh, and and beneath the waves, um, but still in the in the best part of the tidal current. Um, we also realized pretty early on that anchoring these devices is a challenge, and you saw from Simon's slides there as well. They're looking at things like pin piling. Well, we started off right away realizing that just going with lots of weight uh, is very inefficient. So we needed ways to, uh, to 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 anchor the devices to the to the seabed. And we started initially with screw piles, and the other part of the system which we needed uh, was a was a was a turbine technology. And uh, our friends at Shuttle Hydro um, have been developing a, a very nice and elegant and simple uh, turbine which uh, uses passive adaptive uh, foils, um, and so no active pitching mechanism and uh, very robust uh, turbine technology. We ended up actually uh, merging with Shuttle Hydro in 2018, so now. Um, shuttle high, so now we offer the, the, the complete system, including the turbine, um, which are still manufactured for us by shuttle, and shuttle is now our larger shareholder. So we thought we had a system, we put it all together, and we headed out in the water. And uh, in the solid there, we used screw anchors, and uh, we went and put them in. Uh, first time uh, we've been done with a rig like that, we, 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 we cobbled it together ourselves, and, um, and Plato was towed out. And it was all ready to submerge, looking great. And we put her in, and um, yeah, it all worked. And we sort of thought, great, we're off to the races. Um, and then so we went up to Scotland to the famous falls of Warness uh, up at Emac, um, where we thought, okay, now we're ready for the big game. And uh, we met some of our competitors, like Scott Renewables, with a huge two megawatt machine and our little 100 kilowatt uh, Plato there. Um, but it was great being in that sort of ecosystem where there were lots of developers all, all together. Um, pushing the boundaries. Um, and we were very happy to you know, uh, be part of that community and to uh, speak to people and show, show, show our device and our technology. And uh, we went up to site and we did um, what were actually the first drilled rock anchors uh, put in at a tidal site, which is a, an absolute world first and still is. Um, no one else has managed to, uh, to install rock anchors at, at a tidal site. Bauer have done a monopile at the same site. Um, we, we, we took that over. Um, but yeah, and so they developed the rock anchors, which we then used at Connell, and uh, we'll be using it for us. And, and so we're feeling pretty confident that we could um, get out there and, and, and deliver pretty effectively. Um, but we just have one little hitch, because now that the technology is sorted, we need a market. And uh, in the UK, uh, Boris showed up with his red bus. And um, well, we'll see how he goes today when he goes to Brussels. Uh, not looking too good at the moment. Um, but one of the things that happened when the Conservative government got in is they withdrew the, uh, the, the, the market support uh, for any form of ocean energy, which has really made it a very tough couple of years uh, for developers in the UK and means that a lot of the demonstration projects that were planned have been unable to, to, uh, to, to attract the, the private funding. You can only get so far with grants. So we had to get up and really look at what does a market look like for, for, for marine energy? And um, it's still an interesting question. Um, but we went and looked at sites in Southeast Asia, and we went and looked at sites in Canada, and we even went and looked at some of our competitors and what they were doing, and we went and did some surveys, and what we tried to understand a bit more about the, the resource, and what we realized was that, well, there's a lot of sheltered channels out there, or semi-sheltered channels, um, which can provide substantial amounts of power which don't require a submerged solution. Um, and so we figured we could develop something much cheaper and more effective, uh, based on conventional ship-like technology, uh, which is a trimaran. And so uh, with the support of Scottish Enterprise and Waters 3, uh, we put to work to develop a floating platform uh, really targeted the island and coastal community market. And uh, this is the flow wave test tank here at Edinburgh University, where we did all the text uh, tank testing in early 2017 or late 2016, early 2017. 
and uh, yeah, by sort of late 2017, sort of summer, we were we were uh, welding steel together in uh, Peterhead, North of Aberdeen. And uh, then in November, we installed uh, our second set of rock anchors, our second generation. We're now on our third the fourth, uh, successfully in Connell on the west coast of Scotland uh, with Green Marine there. You've already seen the Patrick slides. And uh, yeah, and we installed Play Tie, uh, beautiful, beautiful scenery in the background, snow on the hills, and uh, spent our first uh, winter really learning uh, because it's not until you get to the stage that you really learn what works and what doesn't. And, um, and having a floating platform, um, we're very fortunate because all the little problems that you have and all those teething problems, uh, we can deal with. We just go out, a little rigid inflatable, get on board, swap out a component. Um, and as, you can see, as you'll see there, we've even swapped out blades uh, when we've had problems with blades, when we've had problems with turbines. We actually have spare turbines. We just swap a turbine. It takes a couple hours. So um, those are the benefits of, of a floating system. Um, and uh, but unfortunately, it couldn't stay at Connell because it was only a temporary test site, and there was no way for it to generate any revenue uh, or be able to put the power ashore. So we had to seek. So we had to head west uh, to Canada, and we did that. We went to Nova Scotia, and uh, we reassembled the platform at a local shipyard uh, on the French shore um, called uh, Air Terrier. and uh, it was towed over to the site with some local vessels, some you know, local lobstermen. Um, we we're very proud to tow the vessel to its new home in uh, in, in Grand Passage, and uh, and we've been there, just really um, running it and learning what works and what doesn't, and trying to improve the performance and get all the metrics and do all the environmental uh, uh, monitoring as well. And so, and this is where I mean, as I said, the floating platform just I mean. I think it's the only tidal device in the world currently out there where you can change out blades, change out turbines. And at this early stage, um, that's the way that we build um, and, we, and we learn fast and we build and we build reliability. And we're starting to see that now in the, in the data that we've got. After a couple of years, we've got really, really strong data um, that we can demonstrate um, that we're delivering the power that we expect, that, uh, that the, the thrust force is acting on the platform or as we expect. And then now we can start to look at things and start thinking about things like maybe certification of anchors and primary load path and everything. But it's really only get to you get to this stage that you even want to start thinking about that because you need you need uh, room to innovate. And if you go into the standards world too early, um, it can really adversely uh, impact your development program. So you've got to be careful there. Um, and then, of course, the other key one, a lot of environmental sensitivity, we're in, a, we're in an area which um, their main economic activity besides fishing is actually uh, whale watching tours in the summer. So there's a lot of sensitivity around the marine environment and, and the onus is on us uh, to demonstrate that we don't have any adverse impacts on the marine environment. And as Simon pointed out, uh, we're in this to do good. Um, so we've been putting a huge amount of effort into, into monitoring uh, the impacts and as of yet, there's no adverse impacts that we've seen. Um, and then, so yeah, taking all that learning over the past couple of years. Um, so over the last year or so, we've been working on the design of our new system for force. Of course, going up to force is a, is a, is a, is, a, is another step from Grand Passage. It's a, it's a, it's a very energetic site. Um, and so we've been developing our third generation rock anchors, testing them here in Orkney, and we've been testing our new platform once again at Flowwave um, in Edinburgh. And we've also been doing accelerated lifetime testing um, here in Aachen on our uh, on our drive trains, and we've been testing our blades uh, here in New Bremen uh, with our with our with our blade manufacturer on our on our dedicated test rigs. And so as you've seen with everyone else, lots of onshore testing uh, before you go offshore um, to ensure that um, yeah things that might be uh, relatively easy to sort out onshore don't become big problems offshore. And then this has all been captured into the into the actual build. Um, and here is the platform. Actually, this is now a few weeks old. We're just about ready to launch, um, and uh, now trying to decide whether it's going to be before Christmas or 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 after the break in in the in the new year. But uh, imminent. And uh, to give you some idea of what's involved with the new platform, so this is the Playtar 6.40. So six means it's now got six turbines on it instead of four. Um, and so this gives us, of course, a 50% increase in uh, rate of power. Uh, and the overall platform is only one meter wider um, than the previous one and the same length um, and only slightly, slightly heavier. Um, and this one is a bit more sophisticated. Um, so as well as the turbines uh, being active, 
Uh, we've got the same turret technology as on the 4.63, um, and uh, but we've now moved all the all of the kit into machinery space, um, and we and we are converting to medium voltage onshore, so you get grid ready power coming straight off the platform. It means that we can daisy chain the platforms. We don't need expensive hubs um, to do that for us and to and to convert the power. Um, and we also have uh, now hydraulic uh, systems which can automatically bring the turbines um, out of the water in the case of impact with debris or in any sort of thrust overload situation, so protecting the, the, uh, the device. So why did we end up in, in Nova Scotia and, 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 and why at force? Well, really, really uh, the key one, uh, market certainty. I mean, having a 15-year PPA with a feed-in tariff, as far as that's the only place in the world where we can have that at the moment, and it's so, so, so important. Um, it's an amazing tidal resource uh, with very high capacity factors, very dense energy. Um, all of the infrastructure is in place, and the infrastructure is there with the 64 megawatt grid connection. Um, very stable policy uh, with the Marine Renewable Energy Act, and of course, uh, very strong uh, capital grant support from Natural Resources Canada, as you may have heard about recently. So all together, uh, this creates a project which is very attractive for early stage project investors. Um, and uh, all, the, all those pieces of the puzzle are absolutely required. And so then how do we, how do we remove the risk we're moving into such an energetic site as force? Uh, well, and this is where we use Grand Passage. So it provides the opportunity to prove and improve the technology. It also provides a training site for the team because whenever you set up a new team somewhere, you have to build that capability to execute. Um, as I said, you go to develop and test the environmental monitoring systems and techniques. And uh, one of the great things about a floating device, um, Trevor saying it's difficult with the ones under the water, the great thing about the ones on the water is you can take people out and uh, show them the device and uh, yeah, and they can, they can learn and they can, they can experience what it's actually like to be on board. And so we've gone through quite a process over the past couple of years to get our operational set up and, uh, and, and, and moving in Nova Scotia. And we've got our, our new headquarters in uh, Dartmouth where we've just finished the systems integration for the first 6.4 row. Uh, we've got our test site at Grand Passage and now we'll be up into force uh, next spring. And just in terms of the commercial structure, um, as alluded to earlier, we've, we've had to become um, a little bit of a, also a, 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 I suppose a project developer in, in some respects, and we're working with a project financing partner, but we're wrapping the whole thing into a design, build, and operate contract. So not only are we doing the engineering, procurement, construction, installation, but we will also be operating and maintaining uh, the systems for their full 15 years, uh, which means that, that, that we're really partnering with the financiers for the lifetime and, uh, and standing behind uh, our, our systems. So I think one of the key things that, that, that we've learned in terms of trying to get to a point where we're sort of ready commercially, it's not a linear journey and it's not just about technology development. We also need to be innovative in the commercial sense. And uh, one of the things that I think is an industry, sometimes we're a bit too technology focused and we just uh, are, you know, you see lots of projects being funded where they're just trying to move up the TRL ladder and then you think they're doing well and they just fall away when they get to the top of the ladder, they fall off it because they don't have uh, a commercial plan. And so you really need to understand what's the proposition, how do we prove it, and how do we demonstrate the commercial aspects as well as the technology aspects. And just one of the things that I, I will point out, that I, I quite like the arena um, uh, a sort of matrix, um, but as Simon pointed out on the cost for the, from, uh, from OEE, um, the key here is to get to being a bankable asset class, because once you lower the cost of finance, then really the costs come down quickly. And that's the challenge. You have to get to a point where uh, you can get debt in and the debt providers are comfortable enough with it. Um, but that might require a few iterations around the top, trying to get that alignment between the technology and the market and what people are willing to, uh, to invest in and looking at how, how you're going to stand behind that. And, and uh, so that, that part of it, I would say there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, plays out there, people taking different approaches to it, and that's where I'd say the real innovation is going to be happening in ocean energy here in the next few years. Jason, so what do we need? You passed oh, your sorry. time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, last slide. Okay, so what you. we what we need is a, a market that's large enough and stable enough, and um, this has been quite difficult in Europe without any form, real form of market support mechanism until now. 
And um, so one of the things hopefully now uh, the European Union will start to look at is whether they can publicly underwrite some of the guarantees or provide access to bonds or similar instruments that can be used to develop business interruption insurance solutions. And this is where uh, we'll start to get cheaper capital coming in and this is where we'll get our costs down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, um, I, mean, I, I guess we have already passed our our slot. Uh, I presume we had a 10 minutes break between this session and the other. I have seven questions from the audience, which is uh, which is great, but I'm not sure if we can uh, address them. Um, I would ask Jeanette, can we can we use let's say yeah. these four minutes more to address one or two questions? Uh, well, yes, uh, you can go with the questions, uh, and we have uh, 10 minutes for the questions. Uh, okay. Okay. So there's one first question, which perhaps I could, uh, which is a question from uh, from Guilherme Vaz, uh, and it basically is the same question for uh, for both Patrick Muller and and Jason Eamon, which is on. Let me let me read it. Um, let me read it here. How much work has been put has been put into numerical work for the development of the wave energy converters? Um, and for example, in the in the case of core power, also namely regarding the, the interaction with the, with turbines, uh, for for uh, let's say considering a, a wind farm. Um, so I mean, the question is for both for Patrick and for and for Jason on the the, the work on the numerical modeling that has been put into development of the devices, please. Sure. Do you want to go first, Patrick? <laughs> I can't hear you. Maybe all um, speakers can turn on the camera now. Thank you. Uh, well, I can go first while um, Patrick's sorting out sound, but I mean, I, a huge amount is the answer. Um, you have to start, I mean, uh, with the modeling and getting the maths right and getting the engineering right. That's a prerequisite. Without that, you do not pass go. If you, and I think that's, uh, Fred made this point, I think there's been a huge improvement in let's say the engineering techniques and the computational um, tools that are out there. And there's been a huge amount of learning around the engineering and it's becoming much more professional. Um, and people are understanding the environment that we're working in a lot better than perhaps we did a decade ago. Patrick, you want to, to give your answer? I guess, are you on mute? Because we cannot hear you. Okay, so let me let me let me move to another question. Perhaps we come back to this if we if we can. Um, so I have one question here, also um, not also sorry, a question from uh, Francisco Fonseca, um, which is directed to to Fred Gardner. Um, being a submerged system, how do you foresee that operation and maintenance operation and maintenance will be carried out? What are your thoughts in terms of vessel requirements and cost impacts? Well, the operation and maintenance, what we're looking at is uh, really to have a very fast connection and deconnection system. So, of course, you want to have scheduled maintenance, but there will always be something happening, especially in, in the first part. So, the, the a real overhaul is scheduled at seven years, but uh, if you have to go there, I think you have to bring the system up, put it on deck, put your replacement system down, a bit like uh, what was was discussed just uh, by by Simon, and then uh, repair your device uh, on shore. I think that's the best way to do it. And important there is that you have a, a connection and deconnection system, and if, if possible, even without divers or anything, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I mean, I don't know if you already have Patrick to comment on the first one. No. So let me let me move to the following one. So the following one, uh, basically, I'm, I'm merging two questions: one from Eric uh, Cruz and whether, and one other from um, from Guilherme uh, Vaz, uh, which is on, let's say, on the environmental impacts of of, uh, of the of your device. Uh, so if you could please elaborate a little bit, bit more on on the results that you already have from the environmental assessment that was conducted. Jason, I guess I said. Yeah, sorry. 
Um, yeah, I mean, so basically, I suppose the main thing people seem to be concerned about is uh, collision between the rotors and uh, marine life. Um, but of course, um, I think most of us who spend time in the marine environment understand that uh, marine animals are probably a lot cleverer than we give them credit for. And we don't see too many salmon swimming into rocks uh, when they're navigating in a river. Um, so uh, fish can sense pressure differences and changes in the flow. Um, but the other thing they don't like to do is they don't like to waste energy. So generally you'll find what we're seeing is that there's not many fish around when the, when the current's flowing fast. Um, they go down towards the bottom or to the sides. And so um, really there's very little risk um, of there being a collision between a fish and uh, a turbine. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, I think we had a couple of questions more uh, directed towards uh, core power, but since we don't have Jason, perhaps I have, I, I have. I am back now. It seems. Ah, you're it's back. Yes. Yeah. So let me go back to your first question, which is, let's say, on numerical work. Uh, yes. If you could address that one. Yeah. So of course, numerical modeling is a huge part uh, of of our work. So we run millions of combinations in in modeling before trying something in even model scale. So we have six or seven full time people just running numerical modeling, calibrating our models to uh, tank testing and to actual offshore deployment. So it's a very important tool to do. Yeah, model based development for us. Okay. Thank you. So one next one to, to Patrick as well, um, which is from uh, from Antonio Sarmento, I think, which is what is the level of energy price that you will need along the pre-commercial phase of core power technology and for how many deployed megawatts will this phase last? So the very first pre-commercial arrays that we expect to deploy by 2025, around five megawatts per array, may be around 250 euros per uh, megawatt hour in LCUE. And then I think after having about 150 megawatts in the market, we may be down at around 100. And by having around 600 megawatts in the market, uh, down towards 60 to 70 in, in LCOE. That's what we expect in, in, in our uh, plans today. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps one, one, one last question from my side. Since this is a panel about, let's say, industrialization or towards commercialization, and I guess Jason has, has addressed an interesting topic between technology readiness level and commercial readiness level, if we can put it like this. So my question, which is a bit for whoever wants to, to pick it up, is uh, what are, let's say, the main KPIs that uh, we should look for when, when looking at commercial uh, commercial demonstration, right? What are the key aspects? Uh, Simon also touched a bit on this, but can you please elaborate a bit on what are the main concerns as we go commercial? Can I? Uh... Sure. I think, I think the last presenter was great. You know, he showed this, this matrix of the, the what we need. I think we need good policy. Everybody knows the first systems will be more expensive, expensive than when you build thousand systems. And to accommodate that part, I think that's it. The, if we if we get governments or uh, or even Europe Europe at the moment or even worldwide, you get funds that are able to go through those numbers. Like Patrick is saying, you know, you go down by price. If you can accommodate that, I think you can build any business model you can uh, can have. Okay. Any other comment from any from someone else? Yeah, I, I, I think our experience is that you just, it, it's great to get the uh, government support and it's, de and it's needed at this stage, definitely because of the high prices. But you have to start to bring real commercial investors into the projects now. Um, if you don't, um, there's a chance that you don't end up with something that the market wants. Um, and so we're finding, and actually the ultimate metric is debt ratio and the interest price because yeah. that tells you that people are voting with their wallets and it tells you how interested how secure they feel about your technology and whether they're whether they're willing to lend money against against its performance okay Add yeah. in, uh, of course, revenue support is critical for our early customers to give certainty on those early stage array investments and then of course uh, that allows us to scale the volumes to do what Simon says. I mean, we need to get more energy out from less equipment, 
I mean, decrease the cost, decrease complexity, get up time uh, higher, and so on. All of the points, uh, all of the parameters that drive uh, the cost of energy, which then also reduces the perceived risk, which then reduces the cost of capital, and it's all a circle uh, connected together there. So, yeah. I absolutely endorse, I think, all of those things. Uh, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's, if we were looking at this as a project, as an onshore wind project, or now an offshore wind project, uh, there is a vast amount of capital which is looking for relatively more and more modest returns um, because they have confidence in the technology. And, and, but that takes deployment time, uh, and that's where the, the, the European Union, that's where the Canadian government can sit in and actually help the, the industry happen. Uh, and at that point, you've really reached industrialization when you don't need the governments to do anything anymore um, other than just be governments. And, and we're then competing in a level playing field. And then we'll say, OK, well, we can take coal on head to head, which I think is very much where we're getting to uh, now on the solar and wind side. And I'm really looking forward to seeing ocean energy taking a piece of that. Thank you. I guess you see wanted to make a final comment. Yeah, uh, just to say that. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, uh, the, the level of wave energy cost should be there in the 30, 30 euros or, or so. And I think it's achievable, but we need to move very fast to that level. Uh, uh, the, the thing is that, that we have the challenge that there are solutions, renewable solutions that are there, that are commercial and, and uh, let's say investors or whoever kind of is looking seriously to 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 go with the wave energy they are they are not kind of looking at the situation um, for too long so i think uh, moving fast ahead uh, and uh, and certainly we need some mechanism to support us in the in the beginning can i add one more thing john yeah last comment because we we need to conclude Brad, i know but because I'm a teacher as well, I, I teach the energy system, you know. And if you really take yourself serious and you want to replace the fossil fuel energy by 2050, um, and you see, you really start calculating how much systems you need and how much space you need, you know, the, the, there's no way you can solve this in Western Europe, for instance, with, with wind and solar. You need other systems against any cost to do this. Well, that's a that's a great way to to finish. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the brilliant presentations and this discussion. And I I guess we need to close now as we progress to the next session. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, thank you, Joao, and uh, thank you all to participants.